Good morning. Welcome to this uh, mini series of Just In Case video. Um, we titled the series Just In Case to invite our audience to listen. Just in case you need a reminder of something, just in case you didn't know about something, just in case you need to refresh your memory about the history and theory of a method, or just in case there's some useful wisdom, the organization development practice uh, for you to chew on. These videos will be released every two to three weeks on the Q&A YouTube website. Um, I am Mayan Chung Judge. I am the Director of Quality and Equality OD consultancy um, company that based in Oxford, UK. And um, today, the Just In Case series is um, our, today the, the Just In Case series has a fantastic uh, speaker, Barbara Bunker, doctor and professor. And those of you who remember the large group methods, you cannot go into that method without seeing the name of Barbara and Billy Auburn. And today is incredibly exciting for me to have Barbara on the series to take us through the history of the large group methodology. And at the end of the video, there will be her contact details. And if you like to continue to have some debate or questions, and that's where you can contact her. Barbara, can I just say a big thank you to you for investing time and, um, and your effort in making your thinking available to us. Okay, are you ready to go, Barbara? I am, Mayan, and I'm thrilled to be here. It's always Excellent. fun when you're as old as I am to remember your history, basically. Uh, and. I was very lucky to be in at the very beginning. Great. That takes us strict to the first question, Barbara. So let's go back to the beginning. I, we like to hear about what you think are the problems in organizations that led to the invention of the first experiment that eventually led to large group methods. Well, I, I would want to talk a little bit about the history of group study, basically, because in the 1930s, uh, which seems a long, long time ago, Kurt Lewin fled the Nazis and came to the United States. He was the father of social psychology. And one of his earliest experiments, which was done, was done to study groups, basically. And uh, I was trained by a man named Martin Deutsch at Columbia in the early days of social psychology, when there wasn't much social psychology in the United States, but everybody was studying how groups work. They wanted to understand the phenomena of groups. And in the 1950s and 60s, a, an organization in Washington, D.C. formed called the National Training Labs. And that NTL Institute began to have a summer training program up in Bethel, Maine, basically. And uh, that training program was where I first learned about groups. It was really very exciting. Uh, what happened to me was I was working on a college campus trying to do leadership training for young people. And I didn't know what to do. And somebody sent me to a laboratory, a T group laboratory that stands for training groups. And I began to understand that these social psychologists we're developing ideas about team building, about how groups work, about what makes them productive, about the stages of group development. All of that stuff was, was new in the 1960s and very exciting to those of us who were being trained to use it in our everyday life. So what happened to me was that I uh, got interested in group work and and eventually went on to get a PhD with Mort Deutsch, who was a student of Kurt Lewin, who is a father of social psychology, and uh, also worked with a man at Columbia named Matthew Miles, who was doing the first interventions into school systems. And he was going in there and he was asking questions about, well, what would make this system better? 
And then we were feeding back. This is called survey research. We were feeding back to the members of the school system the issues that they said were troubling. And we problem solved trying to get solutions for some of those problems. So all of this was just brand new stuff. Nobody had ever done it before that we were aware of. So it was a very exciting time for me to be involved in the whole development of groups and interventions into groups and understanding how they worked. I think what's interesting about all of that was that that led to the early formation of OD training. Most of the people who first developed in OD were trained in groups. And uh, the first OD training was in up in Bethel uh, with the National Training Institutes in the early 1970s. And there, uh, in the 1970s, most OD consultants were doing, um, they were doing team building of one kind or another. They were analyzing, they were helping groups work better, basically, and teaching all of this stuff from social psychology. But as, as the 70s developed, it got very clear that there is more in an organization than just groups. And so we began to think about, oh, wow, you know, there's when you think about intervening, you can think about where am I going to intervene? And you can think of an organization as kind of a pyramid. There are the individuals on the bottom. Then there's interpersonal relations, me and my boss, for example. Then there are groups, and that's the stuff we knew how to do something with. And we did team building and team development and all that kind of stuff. But then there's intergroups, and people began to develop designs to help intergroups work better. And then there's the whole organization. And the question that's interesting for an organizational consultant is when you're confronted with an organizational problem, at what level do you intervene? How do you suggest to them? what they need to do in order to solve some of the problems. And I think the person who brought all of this to a head was a man named Marvin Weisbord. And Marv had been in very involved in the training of group people in the 70s and 80s. And he had established with Tony Petrella a firm, the first consulting firm that was a pure OD consulting firm. And they were working with a lot of organizations in the United States. And they got to the point where, uh, you know, they were doing team building all over the world, et cetera. But Marv had this personal experience that was really very interesting, I think. Marv had, uh, his father had a factory. And of course, as a good son, Marv would go down and try to help his dad with problems that were in the factory. And he came he went to his father's factory endless numbers of times and worked with small groups. And what happened was that every time he would go and he'd fix something and then he'd come back and it came unfixed. And he got very, very frustrated. So finally, in a fit of desperation, he announced that everybody in the factory was going to meet together, basically. And, and he confronted them with the fact that they had made all these plans and they you know, hadn't fixed the problems. And he said, you're not going home, essentially, until we have some kind of a solution to this problem. And that was the first time that we had labeled getting the whole system into the room, in quotes, uh, as a, uh, a phenomena that was important in organizational consulting. And when, when he saw how successful that was, those solutions that the people in the factory developed themselves, they stuck and made things better. And so as a result, what happened was that Mark got very interested in how do you get the whole system into the room? And so he went to um, Australia and he met with the Emery's, Marilyn Emery particularly, who was doing something that he had not heard about before, but he'd begun to understand, which was the search conference. She'd done it in government agencies in Australia, in a number of places, very successfully. And that involved bringing everybody in the system together, basically. So there was that, that thing that happened, and that was a breakthrough, and got us thinking differently about how you consult to organizations. 
Then the second story that I that I heard about and that got my attention was Kathy Dannemiller at Ford. She had been doing team building regularly at Ford and was very well liked there. But Ford, the Ford Motor Company was very unhappy about some of their managers. They thought they were not proactive enough, whatever that means. And so one of the things that, that she did was she was working with various teams and she got hauled into the office of the big boss. And they basically said, Kathy, we need you to work with managers. We need you to get them more proactive about the, the work that they're doing. And uh, the only model she had was, you know, a week, several hundred, a group of managers and a week off site, basically and then another group of managers. And that would have been a very remunerative contract. I mean, probably kept her busy for a couple of years, but she was a very interesting woman. She was the daughter of a labor leader and she she was very blunt and outspoken. And she looked at these managers at Ford and she said, it won't work. And they were astounded that an outside consultant would speak to them that way, number one. And number two, that anybody would refuse this kind of very remunerative con contract. So they looked back at her and they said, okay, well, what would you do? And she looked at them and she said, give me a week and I'll think about it. <laughs> so she took herself off and she thought for a week and she came back to them and she said, okay, she said, give me 500 managers in one room for a week. Well, they were astounded at this as an idea. But they had they trusted her. So somehow they got 500 managers in into I think it was two rooms with a bridge between them or something like that. But at any rate, she had them for a week and the work that they did to solve the problems of the system flowed back into the system in an effective way after that meeting. And so that was what the beginning of what she then labeled real time strategic change. And she became famous kind of for all of that. And uh, at, and the, then the third major breakthrough, I think, happened when a guy named uh, Harrison Owens uh, decided that he was bored with meetings and sub meetings and things like that. And he decided that the only the best ideas happened during the coffee breaks. So his idea was, is it possible to design a meeting? that is more like coffee breaks and less like these awful meetings that I go to regularly that are such a waste of time. And so he used the African village as a paradigm because everything flows to the center. And so he created something called open space, which is a meeting which people essentially manage themselves, set their own agenda, work in subgroups, and, uh, uh, you know, just it's a, it's a very fluid event, basically. And that began to be open space. And that was the beginning of open space, which is practiced all over the world by all kinds of people in all kinds of settings. Well, that those three interventions, I think, were the beginning of our being able to have some ideas about that there are ways to work with the organizations that are bigger than just working with small groups like the the people who are manufacturing or whatever. That's an awfully long answer to your question, but you have to realize I'm a really old person and I have a long history. So if you ask me a question, I go back a long way. Well, Barbara, I love it because um, why I know some of it, but just listening to you now, I realized there were other bits I don't know. So this is great. Maybe we need to shoot another part two. <laughs> so thank you. Um, Barbara, you and Billy had a long history of collaboration. And in fact, it was difficult to think about you without Billy and vice versa. So I wonder whether you like to get back to memory lane and share the story behind your collaboration with Billy. I, I really think not just me, but other people would love to be um, it, like eavesdropping on this. Over Good. to you, Barbara. I'd love to. Yeah. 
Billy and I met in the 60s. She was at Bethel. I was at Bethel. We And Edie Seashore was at Bethel. We were the three women who were well known to the, the folks at Bethel. Uh, and th- at that time, women were not easily allowed into training programs. And there was all kinds of, I mean, essentially the National Training Lab, where I got my training, was an, a white all boys club that you was very difficult to get into. And so they picked three that when they got clear that women had some competencies, the three of us, Edie, Billy, and I, were seen as the competent women, you know. And we fought for years with NTL, trying to get them to take other women in. But they we became their symbolic women, basically. That meant we had a lot of advantages. We got a lot of training, et cetera. But it took us three or four years of pushing hard to get them to take more women into their training programs, because there were a lot of women who were extremely competent and who should have been in in their training programs. So Billy and I knew each other in the 70s. But what happened that really produced the large group method stuff that we were doing is that in the middle 80s, I joined as a staff member at the ODHRM program at Columbia. This was a program for HR and OD people that went for three different weeks. And it was a certificate program. And the staff, the three or four of us that were running it, referred to it as the Parade of Stars, because what we did was we brought in all the major OD people, and they had each had a day uh, with the participants to train them in, in the way they were thinking about organization development. And so that meant that Billy and I had a lot more face time than we normally would have had because I lived in Buffalo, she was in New York City. And uh, so we began, a com- we would, at the breaks, we would have these interesting conversations. Things like, Billy, did you hear about what Kathy Dannemeller did at Ford? Yes, isn't that astounding? Uh, Billy, what is it this Harrison own? I don't understand this, this, uh, uh, open space stuff that Harrison Owen is doing. So we were sort of plugged into things that were going on and trying to understand. And as we talked about it, we had this sort of flash and we looked at each other and we said, you know, sometimes things happen in the world at the same time that are major developments. And remember that when the T group this study of groups was developing in the United States. Over in the UK at the Tavistock Institute, the Gestalt therapy group was developing, which was a very similar kind of development. And we had been told and learned as we'd studied that once in a while in the, in the world, in, things pop up in different places in the world that are very similar. So we were thinking about Weisberg, we were thinking about Dan Miller, we were thinking about Owen, and we thought, is it possible that what's happening right now is we're having a pop-up all over the world of these new ways of thinking about intervening in systems. And somebody needs to sort of capture that and have them not be idiosyncratic, separate movements, you know, different places. And so, but we didn't know whether we were right or not. It was just a guess on our part. <clears throat> and luckily, Billy was doing full-time consulting, but I was in the university, in the psych department at the University of Buffalo. And uh, Clay Oliver Yale had been writing me recently and saying, Barbara, the Journal of Applied Behavioral Science needs to do some special I- issues. Do you have any ideas for a special issue. And when he wrote me first, I had no ideas at all. So I said, I will think about it, Clay. That sounds like fun. But I didn't know, you know, I wasn't thinking about anything special. So all of a sudden it hit me. The way to find out whether there's more of this than just the three things we know about might be to send out what we call in academia a call for papers. In other words, if you're going to have a special issue of a journal, you say, we're going to have a special issue on this topic. 
anybody who wants to submit a paper, please submit a paper. So I went to Clay, uh, the editor of Jabs, and I said, Clay, I have an idea. I want to test it with you. Uh, I think that there's more out there than we know about it. I'd like to find out if there are more people doing interesting things that brings a whole system together, basically, rather than just group training. And uh, I said, but I, I can't do that on my own. But if, if we sent out a call for papers, we could find out if that was the case. I said, the thing that scares me is if I'm wrong, if there aren't anything, isn't anything out there, then we'll have a journal that won't happen. He said, don't worry about that, Barbara. He said, on my desk, I have this huge pile of papers about small group development. He said, you, I think this is a great idea. You send out the call for papers. And uh, if you don't get enough to make a fat journal, we'll fill it from the back with small group and we'll call it large and small group uh, development, basically, et cetera. So, we had a plan, basically. And so we sent out the call for papers. And uh, Billy and I were just floored because what happened was we had more papers than we could accept. We didn't fill, we didn't use any of the small group papers. We had to reject some papers, but we filled a whole for issue in 19, I think it was 1992, uh, on large group interventions, basically. Large group methods is what we call it now. and. Uh, all kinds of stuff that we didn't even know about before. I'm thinking about Don Klein's Simureal and, and other kinds of things that were, you know, out there, but nobody ever put them together. So then we began to think about, oh, this is, you know, and people were very excited about that journal. So we, we, we had asked each other, how do we help people understand this? Because reading a journal is not probably enough. So we invented with um, a guy who ran conferences, uh, we invented what we call the Dallas Conferences. And for four years from about 92 to 96, we had a big 200 person conference in Dallas. And that was practitioners and that was potential clients and that was organizations that were interested. So it was a huge mishmash of people, all sort of, trying to understand what was happening here and trying to uh, to get on board with this these methods, basically, and figure out if you were an individual OD consultant, you figure out what do I want to get trained in, you know, because there was beginning to be some training by individuals who were doing these kinds of methods. So it was a, it was a very exciting time. And uh, I think that that we eventually did a book, which came, we were doing a book during the same time, which was um, came out in about 97. But the one interesting thing that I was remember the first time we did this, we we made a presentation at the Organization Development Network, and we decided we would talk about five or six of these methods, and we looked at each other and we said. We're going to talk about other people's methods as though this is some kind of a worldwide development. And what what are they going to think about us talking about these methods, you know, their methods that they believe they belong to? So we went to each of the major practitioners and we said, we're doing we've been accepted to have this session at the OD network. And we would like you to be there. We would like you to come to our session. And after you hear us talk about your method, we're going to call on you to correct us in any way that you need to about did we represent you adequately? Well, not only did they love it, but what we did inadvertently was, you know, people in OD are very competitive with each other and everybody wants, to, you know, to get the clients and that sort of thing. By doing that, by having them all in the room, they got talking to each other. And these Dallas conferences were also full of the same people. The, the originators of all these methods came to the Dallas conferences and they talked to each other. So what happened was that although there was certainly competition for clients, there was not this cutthroat competition that sometimes happens in some kind of consulting settings. They got to know each other. 
And they, uh, it, it was a very fun time where people exchanged ideas and talked about the ups and downs and rounds and abouts of, you know, how you work with clients and, and what the problems are and all that kind of stuff. So I, it was just, it was a lot of fun, basically. We had a marvelous time. And then Billy and I realized that we weren't training people, but they needed to have a, a picture of the whole field because it was it began to be a field. And so we did workshops uh, where we presented 12 or 15 methods briefly and said, you know, you've got a lot of choices out there in terms of how you get trained. But here, here are these methods. They do this. They do that. They do something else. You know, they all... We, we, we set up, we categorize them. We help people understand the world that they came from and what they did, basically. And people were very excited about it. And it was a, it was a lot of fun for us. There's one other thing, Mayan, I need to tell you, and that is a really funny story. Uh, when we decided to do our first workshop, which is probably sometime in the early 90s, we sort of looked at each other. This is about gender. And we said... We've never been to a workshop where two women were running ever. I mean, this is you have to realize that this was a time when this was an all male bastion, you know, and uh, we thought, well, can we get away with this? Will they allow us to do this? Will anybody come? You know, and what was really funny was that that uh, uh, people loved it. And after each of these workshops, particularly women would come up to us and say, I can't tell you how wonderful it is to see two competent women at the front of the room. It just made me, my heart sing, basically. So that was, that was a dividend that we didn't expect, but can happen continually during the 90s uh, because it was such a new phenomenon for people. Wow. You know, Barbara, it's, uh, we have to have a second talk from you because um, right now, two thirds of the OD practitioner are women, and we totally forgot about the struggle uh, of women from your time on. So yeah. we'd love to tap into that history and then see whether we truly has improved the gender equality uh, or what else we could do to kind of grow the talent pipeline and maybe as well as being really fair to the men who are less and less represented in the field. So that's fascinating. Now, you've been talking about training. I, I, I don't know whether this is the right question or not. You know, now, if people want to get large group training, there's quite a lot of training program. But back in 1990s, how do um, anybody get trained other than the workshop you and Billy go uh, offer? Would you tell us a little bit more about that? What happened was that as a result of what we did, individual practitioners who were, were the, the authors of methods began to give their own methods. So Sandra Janoff and Marv Weisberg have been doing search conferences methods for years and years now, basically. And they offer that to people as training. You can go for three or four days and learn the, the ins and outs of how you think about and how you actually run a search conference. Uh, these methods are not, you know, some are easier to learn than others. Uh, the Dana Miller methods are very carefully constructed and they take a lot of competence. And one of the interesting things about real-time strategic change is that although they are run from the front of the room in in about eight or 10, eight, eight person groups at round tables, basically. Oh, I guess I should say something about round tables. When Billy and I started, you could not find a hotel that had round tables except six foot round tables. And these are the round tables that are used in wedding parties for 10 people. And when you have groups of 100 or 200 or 300 in a room and you have six foot tables with 10 people at each table. You cannot hear the people across the table from you. So we started a process of saying to hotels and the places we worked, we need five foot round tables. We can put eight people or nine people at a round table and they can hear each other. And when you're in the room trying to work with a whole series of round tables. Well, 
it was so interesting because most organizations didn't have round tables. They had uh, auditorium type seating, basically. And uh, so I think these methods created um, just a, a fascinating new kind of way of thinking about meetings that wasn't there before. I mean, a lot of organizational meetings were the big boss in the front on the platform flanked by the senior executives and everybody else sitting in the audience uh, ask, raising a hand and asking a question, that sort of thing. And these were just so totally different that uh, they needed new sort of facilities for it. And I remember once Billy and I were walking at the Denver airport in the late 90s, we went by a meeting room and we looked and here were all these round tables of the right size. And Billy said to me, she said, I think we're having an impact. <laughs> you know, pe people are getting round tables of the right size so people can talk to each other, basically. So that that's just a, a, a side story, but it, it amused us. You might like to know a little bit about my partnership with Billy. Well, the interesting thing is I'm the conceptual one and Billy is the Billy is a flaming expert and intuitively very, very sharp. So one of the things I had to learn and we had to learn how to work with each other, which was really interesting. And uh, uh, I, I I'm the one who does all the, the structuring and organizing because that's my style and that's part of how I was trained. And. Billy always had these great ideas. And I realized that so at some point along the line, I realized, I said, she would come up with this idea about what we should do next and that kind of stuff. And, and I would sort of have a think of, oh, my God, I can't imagine us doing that. And uh, I would withdraw and, you know, not say much. I finally realized that extroverts figure out what they're thinking by talking. And so she would put out all these ideas, uh, some of which were great and some of which were awful, just awful. And and as as her partner, I didn't want to say that's awful, you know, but what I did, I figured out how to work with an extrovert who I would say to her, Billy, that's very interesting. Tell me more about that. And then she'd begin to go on about where that came from. And eventually we would have this dialogue where we would generate this great new stuff. But it didn't start with either of us being right about the first idea that we had, basically. And that was such a revelation to me because, uh, you know, she would put out all this stuff. And I was sort of grinding away inside. I'm an introvert thinking about, you know, how to organize this and what were the right kind of combination would be and that sort of thing. Anyway, it's one of the reasons I think our partnership was so much fun for us. I mean, I once I learned that I could trail after one of her ideas and try to figure out where it came from, there was an intuitive rightness somewhere. And and we would come up with great stuff, uh, you know, as a result of that. And I that was a big personal learning for me. I just loved the fact that I didn't have to... Uh, push her off or erase her ideas or whatever. I could work with them and we could be a partnership. Uh, and and I, I, that was, um, that's one of the reasons that we worked very well together, I think. Uh, the other was, a lot of people never realized when we were doing these workshops, Billy had very serious glaucoma and could not see the back of the room or the side of the room basically at, at all. So when people would wave their hands, she wouldn't see them. And so I would just sort of say, Billy, back left. <laughs> and she'd say, yes, she said. And so we worked out this system where people had no idea how visually impaired she was for years and years and years. Um, and uh, it was just, it was neat to have that kind of a relationship with somebody. Uh, Wow, you know, it's uh, having having learned from your having meals with your and spend time with you, and also um, you took asked me to contribute an article in your second large group handbook. 
just watching the two of you work is so inspirational. You know, it's, it's like the ensemble, you know, the jazz ensemble, you know, the trumpet come out and the, you know, trump, uh, the saxophone go. And then the way that you all dovetail and lead up uh, and, and your joint leadership is an amazing thing to watch. So for that. It's then- scary. It was scary for us initially. I mean, we didn't know whether it would be OK or not. So it was so satisfying when it, you know when we were able to kind of roll with the, the figure out where we were and what we were doing and how to do it basically. Yeah. Well, your partnership has really blessed so many of us, not just in role modeling, but in the kind of conceptual work and the practitioner work that you both done. So we, um, this is a bonus question. Billy always talk about that when she was in South America, and there's a major incident with the shipping company she and her husband ran, which led her to think about large group. And I never had enough of that story. And I wonder whether you remember that story well enough to kind of share that with the group. Yeah, uh, that's that's a lovely story. And it's you're quite right. It's right on target, basically. What happened to Billy had a captain's license for for oil tankers at a certain class, basically, because her husband was in the oil transfer business, basically. And uh, so he was not well at some point. He was sick. And a tanker that they had was floating out in the off Ecuador where she lived. And they had to get it in and get it repaired because there was something wrong with what is the drive shaft, which the propeller is back here, and then there's the drive shaft in a very big tanker. That's what keeps the boat going. So she called the people that usually repaired stuff for them in Ecuador, and they couldn't take – oh, she called – They the tankers were big enough that they had to be taken to someplace across the Caribbean to be serviced because the dry docks were big enough, and they didn't have big dry docks in Ecuador. So she called to get this tanker taken, floated over there. And they were busy. They were too, they were all full and they could not take it. And she needed to meet payroll. And she had people working for her that, you know, were going to be in a bad way if they didn't get this boat back on in the water. So she had this idea. She called together all the people who uh, were the people who would be the competent ones about the tanker, the people who were on board, the people from the machine shop that kept it going, et cetera, et cetera. And she did what Marvin Weisberg, in, she did intuitively what Marv did with his dad's factory. She called them together. She had uh, coffee and things to eat and stuff like that. And she said, we have a problem. And I need your ideas. So in subgroups, they were all talking to each other about what they could do to, about this. And after two or three hours of, of uh, she also hired a band because in South America, you have to, you know, you have to have kind of good stuff happening. And so they had this talk, 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 talk. And then finally, after three or four hours, one of the foremen raised his hand and said, we think we have a, we think we have a, an idea. He said, if at high tide we could float this tanker up a certain estuary, which was near them, then at low tide, it would be beached, essentially. The tide would go back out. We could get in if we were careful, and we could take the crankshaft out and plug the hole, and then we could take it to the shop, and we could rework it so that it would do what it's supposed to do. Well, that was a very dicey, you know, highly coordinated idea, but it was the only good one that they had. So Billy led them in figuring out how they were going to do that. And she hired a Marachi band and, and for the, you know, for the workers. And they had like three hours to get it out and they got it out and then they took it to the shop. And then a day or so passed. 
And when you turn a crankshaft, it has to be calibrated in a very careful way. And then it has to be inspected by the inspectors to say that it's, you know, it's done correctly. So they finished the, what they'd done and the inspector came in and the inspector was measuring the crankshaft, measuring the crankshaft, kind of looking glum. And they were all scared to death, basically. And then he, the inspector looks up and he said, it is perfect. And, and everybody clapped and yelled and the band played and they put it back in the ship and they floated the ship out on the next tide and they were able to recover from that uh, problem. And that was her first experience of large group. Uh, she didn't know it at the time, but what she did was to get the whole system in the room and the competence to solve the problem was there. And she released it by supporting them and encouraging them and following their suggestions. And it worked. So that was a piece of her that was just uh, caused her to fully believe in this whole process because she did it intuitively herself at one point and didn't even know what she was doing, which was what made it so wonderful. You know, this must be like six or seven times I heard this story, and I just never tired of this story. It's so exciting. I think this is a good time to go into our last question. You know, this is extraordinary time that we are in now. So maybe we can talk about this, but I'd love to hear your thinking. In today's world, are these methods still relevant, still useful? And and how do we adjust the practice, you know, in order to make sure at community level, at organization level, that it will still harvest those amazing results for, for us? I, I think that's a very important question, Mayon. And yeah. one, one thing that, that troubles me uh, is the tendency in OD to get fixated on solutions rather than understanding kind of what they do. So there was a period of time when large group stuff got to be the hot stuff, you know, and people tried it out once and they, uh, if they didn't do it quite right and it didn't work, they said, oh, that, I did that, been there, done that, you know, that kind of thing. And that's not what this is about. This is about understanding that people in a system need to participate in the system and and that if you allow them if you create a, a setting where they can participate and feel Im effective and useful that will enrich the system and the whole the whole organization will be more effective and better but that's tricky to do because a lot of our organizations these days are enormous and uh, there are there are also you have to ask whether the leadership really understands what they're getting into. In other words, this is not a gimmick that a very authoritarian person can just use in their system. Uh, and for example, I remember one setting where a real time, uh, this is real time strategic change. I was in that setting um, with Kathy and the, they were planning the st strategy for the company for the next couple of years. And the management team brought in a strategy for them to critique and to talk about, basically. And they got a lot of criticisms and they got a lot of suggestions. And they went out and they spent overnight coming back with a new version of it. And the people at the tables, the system did not like the new version. So they went out again, you know. Well, there are a lot of, and they finally came back with a version that everybody thought was doable and exciting and uh, would really move the organization forward. But many uh, executives don't have the internal comfort with that kind of a process. They feel that they have to be in charge. So there's an interesting question for anybody who uses large group methods about how much authority am I willing to allow my people to take take from me? And uh, that's I think that the one place where I've seen disasters happen with using these methods is that that question was not faced by the planning committee. 
initially. And we get to a certain point and the management becomes uncomfortable with the solutions that are being proposed, basically. So I think it's quite possible to use large group methods for either a big thing or a constrained thing. The important thing is people need to know what are the areas of freedom? Where do they really want our suggestions? Where do they really want us to make decisions? And what's off the table? What can't we, you know? And management has a right to reserve to itself, I think, some prerogatives because they are responsible for certain things. So this isn't like saying, oh, anything you guys want, that'll be fine. No, that's not what this is about. This is about getting the people in the organization to focus on an issue that really needs to be changed. And the management wants it changed and the people want it changed. And you get the best kind of solution if you get everybody who knows that whole system thinking about how do we do that? You know, so little kinds of things like um, the GE intervention, um, which I'm forgetting, but that takes takes a problem and then takes all the participants in the problem away for three days. And at the end of the of the three days, the management comes in and says either, yes, that sounds good or no, we can't do that. But that's you know, everybody knows what the structure is. And uh, it's that those kinds of things work very well, but those are carefully defined and just sort of to loosey goosey go off and and, you know, say, oh, let's have a big management meeting and that kind of stuff. Some for some organizations does not work well. And that means that as a consultant, I need to work with the executives a lot in advance so that they understand what's going to happen. And it's not a surprise to them. And they're willing to engage with their participants and and they're willing to be influenced by the people in their company. Uh, and the people who are on the shop floor need to understand they're not going to get everything they can think about. You know, it's not going to happen, you know, but they will have some influence. And that's different from all the decisions trickling down from the top. So it's it's sort of helping people understand what this stuff is rather than having fantasies about, oh, how wonderful this is going to be, that I think is very, very important. That is something that I always remember you and Billy uh, taught, which is getting quite a tight parameter set up so mm-hmm. that the top few save and then so that you align expectation. I also think that you and Billy are the one that who told me about how this method unleash kind of different types of freedom, the freedom to participate, freedom to voice, freedom to dream, freedom to co-construct, and a particular within a systemic interdependency framework that means different parts actually make contact with each other so the whole system see the big picture. Um, I guess I'm also trying to answer this question myself. I wonder whether as long as this principle is um, being held and the tight, loose balance get gets right, um, this sort of methodology will continue to be amazingly fruitful for organization or for community. What do you think? I think so. And I think it's interesting. You know, it's even like the Axelrods have been doing strategic redesign of organizations using it. I mean, that's amazing, you know, yeah. but they involve everybody in the organization. They have these real clever little ways of letting people drop in and see things and react to them and, and that sort of thing. I mean, so it's, it can be about very big issues or it can be about very focused, you know, we got a real problem. We got to figure out how to solve this. Uh, but what it does is to engage the competency of the system. And it's uh, the one caveat I think I would have. I had a a student who was working at a uh, financial firm and she worked for two years in in a a group that was asked whether they would solve a particular problem. And they came up with what she thought was really wonderful kind of ideas about what could happen. And then the company decided they weren't going to do any of those things. And this woman said to me, Barbara, she said, I will never commit myself to an organization the way I committed to that work group and what we put in to to make that those solutions available to them. She said, I 
she was burned basically by that experience. So the the caveat here is you don't tell people that they can they're going to have influence and then take it away from them. Uh, and if you give people agency and the ability to make suggestions and participate in decision making, you have to be really serious about that. And and you will you ruin employee motivation if you just sort of close the door and say, OK, that was very nice. Now we'll make all the decisions, basically. So this is a this is a way of being with with people who work with you, not not some cute little method that you can bring in from outside like a lollipop and give it to people. I love the way that you use this terminology. <laughs> you know, it is true that isn't it that sometimes management think they 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 bring a lollipop and then the sweetness itself temporarily will satisfy people. Yeah. But that is not what you talk about. Yeah. It's absolutely great talking to you, Barbara. So maybe what we can do is to think more about um, you do another part about women history. I'd love to hear more from you. So on behalf of the audience, may I say a big thank you to Barbara for her wonderful description of the history, um, which demonstrate a wealth of experience and wisdom in her. And she is truly our women guru in the field. So thank you, Barbara. And at the end of the video, um, there will be her contact address. Do you have one last thing that you'd like to say to the audience, Barbara? Just that when you're as old as I am and you have as much history as I do, it's hard to slow me down <laughs> about all the things that I can can think about, basically. But it's it's fun for me, and I appreciate May on being asked to do this. It's really a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you.